Hi, I'm Dr. Kat Fries from Central New Mexico Community College. In video F, we're going to focus on the diencephalon of the brain. As I've mentioned before, the four major parts of the brain, that is the cerebrum, the diencephalon here in the lime green, the cerebellum, and the brain stem, each one of them is made up of three subparts. In the case of the diencephalon, these three subparts include the thalamus, the hypothalamus, which sits anterior and slightly underneath the thalamus or below the thalamus, and the epithalamus, which, as it says, sits on top of the thalamus. The word diencephalon literally means through the brain, and it implies that almost all sensory input, except for smell, must pass through the thalamus of the diencephalon. So almost all information that enters into the brain, except for smell, has to go through the thalamus portion of the diencephalon. And we also see that motor output that leaves the brain also passes through the thalamus. Finally, it's always really important for you to remember that the whole brain, anatomically speaking, is bilaterally symmetrical. So we're really only seeing one half of the diencephalon here. You need to try to visualize the other diencephalon half or hemisphere. And in between these two hemispheres, that is where we find our third ventricle, which is, of course, again, filled with cerebrospinal fluid. It's always pretty easy to locate the diencephalon because the biggest part of the diencephalon is the egg-shaped thalamus right here. We see one hemisphere of our egg-shaped thalamus. And maybe that egg shape is not quite so obvious, but we always see this darker dot that is part of the thalamus. It's a little structure that forms a bridge between the two hemispheres of our thalamus. Sometimes we'll talk about the thalamic hemispheres. And this interconnecting structure, a type of commissure, you could argue, is the intermediate mass. Sometimes this is also referred to as the interthalamic adhesion. So this is also called the inter, in between, thalamic adhesion. So as the name says, the hypothalamus is going to be located below hypo or inferior to the thalamus. Now let's forget, let's not forget what is anterior and posterior in this picture because many of the pictures that I provide to you do not show the brain in the same direction. Remember that where you see the cerebellum right here, this always tells you that that is posterior. So this is the posterior portion of the brain and of course then this side is anterior. And therefore we look for that hypothalamus below the thalamus on the anterior side. So right here, this is your hypothalamus. Actually, I should draw it more like a triangular region, more like this. We can often locate that quite easily because dangling off the um, hypothalamus is the famous gland of the brain called the pituitary gland. Now the epithalamus sits on top, epi on top of the thalamus. So our epithalamus is located right here. I'm drawing it in the yellow. And also the posterior portion here of the thalamus is part of our epithalamus. One second, let's go back to the hypothalamus because protruding from that hypothalamus, we have this little bulge here, and there would be one in the other hemisphere of the hypothalamus as well. And that is a protruding pair of nuclei. Remember what the definition of, is of a nuclei collection of cell bodies. So the whole diencephalon, by the way, is full of nuclei, which are going to appear as gray matter. And some of the nuclei 
will actually stick out of our structure, as is the case in the hypothalamus. And we refer to these nuclei that are bulging out as mammillary bodies, because when we see them together as a pair, they look as two little nipples, which is what mammilla uh, refers to. Of the three subparts of the diencephalon, that is the thalamus, hypothalamus, and epithalamus, the thalamus is the largest, making up about 80% of the diencephalon. And as I've mentioned, everything is bilaterally symmetrical. Um, so we see these two egg shapes in this frontal view of the brain. And by the way, this is once again one of those three-dimensional images. If you just copy and grab um, right here this link, then you can rotate this image. Again, for those of you who have a hard time visualizing these various structures we're learning in the, in the brain uh, in all directions. And the two egg-shaped portions, hemispheres of the thalamus, are interconnected here by means of that interthalamic mass. So right here where I filled it in with the blue is that interthalamic adhesion, I should say, or the intermediate mass. I better be consistent in my use of terminology. Where, do the, where does the third ventricle sit? The third ventricle actually sits right here, right about here, maybe not quite that long, but right in between these two hemispheres. And that means that in this third ventricle, there needs to be a hole through which that intermediate mass can pass. So we mentioned earlier that everything that enters into the brain except for olfaction, which is smell, must first go through the thalamus. And even motor output must first pass through the thalamus. So the thalamus is often referred to as the big editor of the brain, or you can think of it as the gateway for all the sensory information, or even a switchboard. In other words, the thalamus can look at all of that information that enters and that needs to leave the brain and modify some of it. So for instance, it can sort out uh, information according to its importance, uh, whether it is worthwhile passing on to the rest of the brain. We are exposed to many, many stimuli in our body and not all of those stimuli must necessarily reach our brain. Um, sometimes the information is also organized into groups such that the information can arrive into the correct location of the cerebral cortex, for instance, as a group. And the thalamus also plays a very important role in learning and memory. Once again, the thalamus is one of the several structures that is part of the limbic system the limbic system being our emotional brain. And remember that often our emotional experiences uh, are what are going to form our memories. Here we're looking at a mid-sagittal view of the brain. You can easily recognize the location of the corpus callosum as well as the fornix. Remember this membrane in between these commissures is called the septum pellucidum, and that membrane separates two ventricles called the lateral ventricles. So just deep to the fornix is where our egg-shaped thalamus, or one half of the thalamus, is located. You can very easily see that intermediate mass of the thalamus. That's kind of your landmark. And now it's a matter of figuring out what is anterior and posterior. Clearly here is the cerebellum. You are now also familiar with the shape of the whole uh, cerebrum. And so right here, this somewhat triangular green area that I filled in is more or less the location of the hypothalamus. And if you look carefully, here is a little bulge sticking out which is one of the mammillary bodies, those nuclei that are part of the hypothalamus. In addition, here we can see the pituitary gland dangling off of the hypothalamus. 
There's one other structure I'd like to point out on this diagram that always sits right nearby the hypothalamus, which is this one right here, which I'm coloring in the blue, and that is called the optic chiasma. This is where your optic nerves that leave the backs of your eyeballs cross over such that the information from your right eye will arrive in the left primary visual cortex and vice versa. So the mammillary bodies of the hypothalamus protrude such that when we look at them as a pair, which we can do here when we look underneath the brain, so here we're looking um, at the two little nipple-like mammillary bodies. And just anterior to them, we can now see how the two optic nerves meet and cross over to form the optic chiasma. And once these nerves enter into the brain, we now refer to them as the optic tracts. And so you see them continuing into the brain right there. So when you, when you locate these tiny little mammillary bodies and the optic chiasma right here, you know where the hypothalamus is located. By the way, these mammillary bodies play an important role in forming a relay station for olfactory pathways. So that is um, smell is going to be converted into action potentials and these action potentials are going to travel up sensory neurons which are then going to synapse and one of those synapses is going to occur in these mammillary bodies. The hypothalamus is a very important part of our brain when it comes to our viscera. We haven't really talked a whole lot about the viscera because when we discussed the cerebral cortex, we focused primarily on sensory information and we also talked a lot about control of our skeletal muscles. But now that we're in the diencephalon, we can see that the hypothalamus is the big supervisor of all of our viscera. Our viscera include, of course, our heart, our lungs, our guts, our bladder, our uterus, if you have one, um, our blood vessels. All of these things um, belong to what we call the viscera. And so the big boss of all of these viscera is the hypothalamus. And the hypothalamus will control them via structures in the brain stem. And so we'll get to the brain stem later. Because of that function, we often refer to the hypothalamus as the visceral control center of the body. This is a very common term used by all physiologists. And by controlling all of these viscera, it helps maintain homeostasis in the body by regulating our glucose levels, by regulating uh, um, various hormone levels, by regulating blood pressure, by regulating heart rate, how fast we breathe, um, our body temperature, how, you know, is it time to eat or not? These are all things that our hypothalamus regulates, our sex drive, our water intake, etc., etc. The hypothalamus also belongs to the limbic system, that is our emotional brain. And so we see that it also plays a role along with the amygdala with regards to emotional responses involving pleasure and fear and, and anger and rage. In addition to that, it plays a role in regulating our rhythms, our biological rhythms of sleeping and being awake and our various drives to either eat, to either drink, to either have sex, to, to sleep, all of these um, things that we do as, as animals, basically. And of course, anything that is part of the limbic system very often is going to be involved in memory. Now, since 
the hypothalamus is connected to the pituitary, we find that the hypothalamus regulates the pituitary by itself producing hormones. So the hypothalamus may be part of the nervous system, but because it produces hormones that in turn control the secretion of hormones by the pituitary, the hypothalamus is also considered an endocrine gland. As a matter of fact, two of the hormones that are secreted by the pituitary are actually made in the hypothalamus. And they're called ADH, which stands for antidiuretic hormone, as well as oxytocin, which we have discussed at the beginning of the semester when we learned about positive feedback in childbirth. The final major subpart of the diencephalon is called the epithalamus. Now, before we point out structures here, let's make sure that we're all clear on the fact that this is posterior and this is anterior. So depending on which picture you look at, um, anterior and posterior might be in different directions. You see that little dot right here, which is your landmark. That's the intermediate mass of the thalamus. And of course, the third ventricle runs right through the middle of the thalamus and even part of the hypothalamus. So the hypothalamus is located here. We do not have um, the pituitary gland showing here and not much of the optic chiasm showing here either. And so the epithalamus, as the name says, is going to be sitting on top of the thalamus. But also it sits um, posterior to the thalamus. And therefore we have two major parts that make up the epith epithalamus. The part that sits on top of the thalamus, kind of hugs it on top, is called the choroid plexus. Now, the term plexus in anatomy always refers to some kind of a network. A network of nerves, a network of capillaries, some kind of a network. In this case, it's going to be a network of capillaries. Choroid always refers to capillaries or blood vessels. Right, so which is why they've used a reddish color on this picture. So right here we see the choroid plexus. Now, <clears throat> this is not the only location of the choroid plexus. We actually find it hanging off the roof of other ventricles as well, such as the lateral ventric ventricles that we see on either side of the septum pellucidum, and even in our fourth ventricle, which we haven't really pointed out much here, but in there, we also have hanging off the roof of that ventricle, um, the choroid plexus. So it's a capillary bed that's more or less continuous between the ventricles. Now, on the very posterior side of the thalamus here, we have a little gland that is considered part of the epithalamus, which is called the pineal, pineal gland, sometimes called the pineal body. I've heard some people say pineal gland or pineal body. And let's take a closer look at some of these structures on the next slide. So the epithalamus is made up of primarily the pineal gland and the cord plexus. So the pineal gland is also a hormone secreting gland. It's therefore an endocrine gland. And the hormone it secretes is called melatonin. Yes, this is what you can go purchase over the counter at the grocery store. Now, you never know how much of the melatonin you get in these products you buy at the grocery store because they're not quite regulated yet. But we know that this particular hormone plays a, a, an important role in regulating our sleep-wake cycle. It's part of the reason why you want to take melatonin to uh, go to sleep or to keep you asleep or perhaps 
to allow to go to sleep when you have shifted time zones because your melatonin levels, they tend to rise prior to your normal bedtime. So they make you sleepy. And as you get closer to rising time, your melatonin levels normally drop. These melatonin levels can also impact your mood. As we know very well, anything that impacts our sleep-wake cycle is also going, typically going to impact our mood. It's often referred to as our third eye because it's responsive to the stimulation by light. And it is thought that the reason for why we see so much more depression amongst humans in areas that are farther north, you know, if we get closer to the Canadian border in Canada, or if we look in Europe, if we look at, for instance, the the Nordic countries, or even where I'm from, Belgium, the Netherlands, those countries, um, we don't see the sun very much, not even during the summer. Um, as a matter of fact, it's most often quite cloudy. And people in these areas are often diagnosed by something called SAD, which stands for Seasonal Affective Disorder. Or you might be living here in New Mexico, where we have uh, the highest amount of, of not just UV radiation, by the way, in the United States, but the highest number of sunny days. But in the winter, those, the amount of sunny sunlight hours is drastically diminished. And so people here might be um, suffering from SAD. And it's due to the fact that we're just not stimulated enough by natural sunlight. That brings us to the second part of the epithalamus called the choroid plexus. Remember, it's a capillary bed that hangs off the roofs of the ventricles and they're pretty much interconnected. Now, what is their role? Well, the role of these, these capillary beds is to provide the blood plasma that then with the help of the ependymal cells, um, can f these ependymal cells are going to help filter that blood plasma, which then ends up being cerebrospinal fluid. Remember that the ventricles, and we also see the central canal in the spinal cord, both these structures, these types of structures, are lined by ependymal cells. Remember those are some of your supporting cells of the central nervous system in the nervous tissue. And they have various adaptations. We'll look at them more closely in a later video, but some of those adaptations are going to help with the production of cerebrospinal fluid, which they create by helping uh, with the filtering of blood plasma. So this wraps up our discussion of the diencephalon. We're going to next discuss the brainstem.